Chapter Five of Mary's Grammar by Jane Marset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jennifer Dalman. Chapter Five: Verbs. Lesson Seven. There had been no lesson of grammar during the whole week in order that Mary might have time to fix in her memory what she had already learned before she began anything new at length she brought her exercise and showed her mother that she had gone through the whole of the story of the hen and chickens and had found out in it the several parts of speech she had learned her mother then thought it time to proceed to the verbs mary accordingly fetched her grammar and her mother read as follows a verb is a word which signifies to be to do or to suffer i cannot understand that at all said mary with a long face you will like the verbs that do something best said her mother so we will begin with them come here mary and as mary approached she added well what are you doing now i am going to you mamma as you desired me then going is a verb and how do you go you see mamma said mary smiling i am walking and is walking a verb too yes certainly then mary began to run now i am doing another verb she said run must be a verb also and presently she ran out of the room her mother wondered what she had gone for but she soon heard her coming back with her skipping rope and when she came in she skipped very lightly around the room looking all the while at her mamma and smiling as much as to say you see i know that skipping is a verb too when she reached the door off she went again but soon returned with her hoop which she trundled around the table very well mary i see that you understand that to skip and to trundle are verbs but if you run away every time you find out a new verb we shall not get on much so now sit down on that chair mary seated herself and her mother asked her what she was doing then nothing at all mamma i am sure i cannot be doing a verb now for i am sitting quite still but there are some still quiet verbs mary as well as busy active ones when you sit down you do something for you sit besides you were speaking to me and speak is a verb also mary began laughing oh what a number of verbs there are she said to laugh is another verb said her mother and sometimes a very noisy one so then you may do a verb said mary without moving about if to sit and to speak and to laugh are verbs yes and you may do a verb as you call it even without the slightest motion of any part of your body for the actions of the mind are verbs as well as those of the body so to think to hope to fear to wish are verbs as well as to ride to walk to eat and to drink while i was working this morning mamma i was wishing that my cousins might come to-day and hoping that they would and thinking all about it but it seemed to me that i did not do anything but work your body did nothing else but your mind was active as you describe and your thoughts mary are part of your mind then verbs not only express the actions of the mind and the body but their state or manner of being such as being hot or cold or being hungry or tired or being pleased or vexed well i am sure i am always either being a verb or doing a verb for i am always busy about something unless i am tired or sleeping and those you know are being verbs then mary verbs do not only express the action or being of men women and children but of all animals and all things as the sky is bright the flowers are faded the nut is cracked your frock is torn indeed mamma said mary looking anxiously at her frock i did not know it where is it the rent will soon be mended said her mother smiling it was only a make-believe example of the state of your frock oh mamma there is one verb i want very much said mary i am so hungry to be hungry is a verb it is true replied her mother but to want to be hungry is not very pleasant in my opinion oh no mamma the verb i want is to eat i rather think that you would like a noun substantive to eat said her mother 
giving her a slice of cake. Mary began eating, and between the mouthfuls she said, Now I have got the noun, and I am doing the verb. Having finished, she complained that the cake had made her thirsty. That is one of the still quiet verbs, she said, but I should like to do one of the more busy verbs with a noun, Mamma. Can you guess what I mean? I think I can. You want to drink some water. Indeed, how cleverly you have guessed it. To drink was the verb, and water was the noun. I must tell you now, Mary, said her mother, that there are three different sorts of verbs, called active, passive, and neuter. I know what an active verb means, cried Mary. It is a busy verb, when you are doing something active. Like that bird yonder. Look, Mamma, how fast it flies. I am sure to fly must be an active verb. No, my dear. An active verb means not only that you do something, but that you do it to somebody or to something else. When I say, I love, I mean that I love somebody or something else, do I not? Yes, Mama, you love me. But when the bird flies, his flying has nothing to do with anyone else. Yet, Mama, you sit there quite still while you love me. How can that be an active verb? I think when I love you, Mary, so my thoughts are active, though I do not move. However, if you wish for something more active, come here. And she gave Mary a kiss. To kiss is an active verb, because you must kiss some person or thing. Now, Mary, if you are not satisfied, added she, laughing, I can strike you, and you will think that active enough. And she gave Mary several little taps. Oh, yes, I understand it, Mamma. Though the bird moved so fast when it flew along, it did not meddle with anybody or anything in flying. So to fly is not an active verb. Now can you tell me, said her mother, when Willie flies his kite, is it a verb active or not? Mary was puzzled. She pondered a little and then suddenly exclaimed, Oh, a verb active, to be sure, because he does not fly like a bird but he flies his kite, and that, you know, is making something else fly. So to fly a kite must be an active verb, though to fly is not. Her mother now told her that she had learnt enough of verbs for one lesson, and that they would go on with them at the next. Continuation of Verbs, Lesson 8 When Mary came with her grammar the following morning, her mother told her that the next sort of verb was called a passive verb, which means, she said, that instead of doing anything yourself, something is done to you. If you say, I am beaten, it means that someone beats you, while you remain passive. Indeed, Mama cried Mary, I should not remain passive if I were beaten. I should run away as fast as I could. And off she ran so close to the fire that her mother called out, Take care, Mary, if you go so near the fire, you will be burnt. Can you tell me what sort of verb to be burnt is? That would be something done to me, Mamma, for I am sure I should not do it myself. It hurts so. It would be something, not somebody, that burnt me, for it would be the fire that burnt me. But I suppose whether it is a thing or a person does not signify. No, said her mother, it makes no difference what it is that acts upon you. To be burnt? to be beaten, to be scolded, are all passive verbs. I think passive verbs are very disagreeable, said Mary. One has nothing to do but remain quiet and suffer something to be done to you. No, said her mother, that is not necessary. If you were burnt, you would probably scream out for help and run away. But unless you extinguished the flames, so long as you were burnt by them, the verb would be passive. When you are acted upon, you are considered as passive, whether you remain quiet or not. To be caught is a passive verb, whether you struggle to get free or not. To be thrown down is a passive verb, though you are certainly in motion whilst falling. But you are put in motion by some person or thing acting upon you and making you fall. Oh, yes, said Mary, but if I throw myself down, it is an active, not passive verb. Yes, because you are, in that case, both the person who acts and the object acted upon. But all passive verbs, Mary, are not disagreeable. What do you think about the verb to be loved? 
oh that is very pleasant but mamma i thought you said the verb to love was an active verb to love is an active verb replied her mother because you love another person therefore you act upon another person but to be loved is when another person acts upon you you may say i am loved by sophie well then i should love sophie in return in that case said her mother you would return to the active verb to love in the passive verb you cannot act nor even move unless you are moved like a log or some other inanimate being as when you are thrown down or you may be pulled or pushed or driven or drawn but the instant you move of your own accord the verb is no longer passive to be admired to be praised to be caressed are also agreeable passive verbs yet i like the active verbs the best mamma because i have something to do myself then said her mother you will like the third kind of verb which is called the neuter verb for there you not only do something yourself but you do it by yourself without acting on anything else what like the bird that flew mamma exactly to fly is a neuter verb and so is to walk and to run let me think of some neuter verbs mamma to cough to sneeze to sit to stand to sleep must all be neuter verbs for when i do those verbs i do not meddle with anybody or anything else true said her mother but now mary we have been talking so long about verbs that i think we must go into the garden to refresh ourselves so run and put on your bonnet mary was soon ready and they went out look at that snail mamma said she how slowly it crawls to crawl is a neuter verb i remember that but i will make it go a little faster she gathered a twig and touched the snail with it the snail drew in its horns oh poor little snail said her mother do not hurt it indeed i did not hurt it mamma it is only frightened to be frightened is a passive verb for the snail is passive while i frighten it but she added if i say i frighten the snail that must be an active verb true because you act upon the snail to frighten is an active verb because you must frighten some one but to be frightened is a passive verb because the frightened creature is passive yes but mamma the snail when it was frightened drew in its horns then it became active for to draw in your horns is an active verb then mamma the snail is both active and passive at the same time for i am sure it is frightened when it draws in its horns it is active replied her mother in the verb to draw in its horns and passive in the verb to be frightened mary's attention was soon called off by the sight of a man beating a dog oh mamma she exclaimed look at that naughty man i am sure to beat is an active verb see how his arm moves and what blows he gives the poor dog who stands quite passive i wish mamma continued she that when we go in you would write down some active and some passive and some neuter verbs as you did the degrees of comparison of the adjectives and when they returned to the house her mother took a pen and wrote as follows active passive neuter to love to be loved to dance to hate to be hated to rise to lay to be laid to lie to send to be sent to sit to tease to be teased to stir to bid to be bidden to run to tell to be told to leap why mamma cried mary the active and the passive verbs in this list are all the same i do not mean the same verbs but the same things that is generally the case said her mother reflect a little and you will find it so if you love there must be some object to be loved you may love sophie or you may love strawberries or you may love pictures the active verb you know means that there is some object to be acted upon sophie strawberries and pictures are the objects you act upon while they being loved form the passive verb oh yes to be sure said mary i did not think of that 
if i tease somebody there must be somebody to be teased you mary who tease are the active person and call the agent of the verb and the person who is teased the object of the verb try to remember those distinctions there is a great deal more to be learnt about verbs my dear but i think you have had enough of them for the present oh but a little story at the end mamma you will not forget that now i shall have five sorts of words to look out for nouns pronouns adjectives articles and verbs very well mary i will write you a story for to-morrow the fisherman a fisherman and his wife who were very poor lived in a little hut by the side of a river they had two children jack a stout lad eleven years old and jenny who was only eight the fisherman had a boat in which he and his son used to go to the river to lay their nets when they caught plenty of fish they were very glad because they took them to the next market town and sold them for several days the fisherman had caught but very few fish and when he had but few fish to sell he could get but little money to buy food for a long time the family had nothing but bread and potatoes for dinner and the poor children longed for a little meat and some milk for their bread at breakfast one day the fisherman in drawing up his nets felt that they were very heavy well we have caught a fish or two at last he said come jack lend us a hand to heave in the nets this was soon done when to the surprise of both father and son only three fish were found in them one of them it is true was very large but it was still more remarkable for its weight why one would think this fish was made of lead said the fisherman there must be something inside when the fish was dead he ripped it open and what should he find instead of lead but an old purse full of gold well good luck has come at last cried the fisherman this money is just in time to pay my quarter's rent but here's enough to last for years and i promise you a new suit of clothes jack and there's enough to buy a new gown for jenny too father is there not ay and for your mother and all they hastened home with their newly found treasure and the wife was no less pleased than they were but she could not help saying what a sad thing it must be to the poor man who lost it poor man repeated her husband i think he must be a rich one to have so much gold ay while he had it she replied but now that he has lost it he must be poor mayhap he may have a deal more said the fisherman however there is no finding out whom it belonged to once so now it belongs to me who have fished it up i wonder how it got into the river cried jack and how the fish came to swallow it said jenny for gold is not good to eat no but it will buy many things that are replied her father and i promise you a rare dinner to-morrow what do you say to a beefsteak pudding and a pot of ale they counted over twenty guineas the fisherman's wife rubbed them as bright as she could and put them into her husband's leathern purse and she gave the old purse which was quite worn out to jenny there were two metal rings or runners to this purse and little jenny tried to rub them bright as her mother had done the guineas when the dirt and rust were rubbed off she saw that there were letters engraved on the runners and she took them to her brother who could read a little he examined the letters a long time and at last made out these words mr cullen heath lodge good heavens exclaimed the mother this purse belongs to mr cullen and we must restore it she added with a heavy sigh but father found it said jack and if he had not fished it up mr cullen could never have had it that don't signify replied her mother whatever is found must be restored to the owner if you can find out who he is the fishermen agreed with his wife they regretted very much all the good things they had intended to buy with the gold but it was settled that the next morning while the fisherman went to draw his nets jack and jenny should carry the gold to heath lodge which was about two miles off the next morning away they trudged and as they went they talked of the number of things they could have bought with so much gold if father had kept but one of the guineas it would have bought us new clothes and one good dinner at least said jenny and i think that would have been but fair as he found the purse father knows best replied jack and he said that it would not be honest to keep back a single penny 
but that perhaps the gentleman would make us a present for taking back the money oh i dare say he will cried jenny what do you think he will give us indeed i can't tell said the lad but mind you don't ask for anything look yonder's the house now take care to behave yourself jenny and make a low curtsey as soon as you see the gentleman when they were shown into mr collins's room jenny dropped one of her best curtsies jack took off his hat scraped his foot and then holding out the purse there's your purse sir said he father found it inside of a fish mr cullen was astonished at the sight of his purse it is no less than two years he said since i lost it it dropped into the river one day when i was rowing and i never expected to see it again the purse is spoiled it is true but there is every guinea in it safe the runners are not spoiled said jenny for i rub them bright and so jack read your name you are very good children said mr cullen and i thank you for restoring my purse jack made his bow and was going away but jenny was so much disappointed that mr cullen had made them no present that she burst into tears what's the matter my dear said mr cullen oh nothing at all sir cried jack come jenny don't be so silly she is only crying about the new gown father had promised her and the beefsteak pudding and ale for dinner ay and father can't pay his rent neither sobbed jenny willing to defend herself from being thought guilty of selfishness and why not inquired mr cullen oh sir because he is so poor when he found this purse he thought the money was all his own till i rubbed the runners bright and jack read your name upon them and then he said it would be dishonest to keep it that is very true said mr cullen you did quite right to bring back the purse tell your father that i shall go and see him to-morrow morning to thank him for restoring the money jack again made his bow and jenny dropped her curtsey with as good a grace as she could when mr cullen chucked her under the chin and smiling archly said beefsteak pudding was it lassie would not beefsteak pie do as well jenny could not understand what he meant but thinking his joke rather ill-timed replied pettishly we shan't have either sir they then trudged home in sober sadness the following morning mr cullen did not fail to keep his promise of calling at the cottage of the fisherman and after thanking him for his purse inquired particularly into his circumstances and in what way he might be of service to him he learnt that the ill success of fishing which had brought the fisherman into distress proceeded in great measure from the badness of his nets he declared he spent all his spare time in mending them but they were so completely worn out that it was almost labor lost mr cullen then asked the dame what it was she was in most need of she thanked his honor and said she had a fine large pig which would serve them for bacon throughout the winter if she could buy meal to fatten and salt to cure it but she had not money for either mr cullen then turned to the children and inquired whether they went to school no said the fisherman though they have a mighty desire to go for some of their playmates go to the school but i have not the means to send them for it would be as good as cheating my landlord to pay for my children's schooling whilst i cannot pay my rent well do not let that disturb you my good friend said mr cullen you owe your landlord nothing the fisherman stared when mr cullen continued i learnt from little jenny there that you were at a loss for your rent and i sent and paid it this morning you are rent free to this time twelve month then if your children will attend school diligently i will pay their schooling what say you said he addressing himself to them oh i shall never fail answered jack unless father wanted me to draw the nets but i could lend a hand at that between school hours jenny was vastly pleased but looked at her mother who answered for her that she would be very regular in her attendance for she added though it may give me somewhat more to do at home i am sure in the end it will answer better for myself as well as the girl that she should be a bit of a scholar no one knows but those who can't read and write what a thing it is to have a child that can why even the little that jack knows is of great use to us you see sir added the good woman with a great simplicity it was jack found out your name on the runners of the purse 
then sir it is a mighty savings to have one's clothes mended neat and strong we can botch them up after a manner but the girls at the sewing school would be ashamed of such work why they would set you in a patch that you shan't be able to find out mr collin then took leave and said that they should hear from him again the next day accordingly the next day a cart of mr collins drove up to the cottage door and a variety of things were brought into the house first there was a sack of meal to fatten the pig and a bag of salt to cure it then came a large beefsteak pie and a small barrel of beer the children's eyes sparkled with pleasure but what was their delight when two parcels were opened in which they found a complete suit of clothes for each of them the man who drove the cart bade jenny observe that the close straw bonnet and the warm cloth cloak were for her to wear in cold weather to go to church and to school jenny who dearly loved a little finery jumped about for joy lastly there was a package of new nets for the fishermen in short there was not one of the family who had not cause to rejoice and to be grateful to mr cullen for the kind return he made them for their honesty the school was a source of great improvement to the children the fisherman and his wife worked hard to do without their aid the pig was fattened and in due time salted and the fish when once in the net finding no holes in it through which they could escape were brought safe ashore and by their sale afforded the family a comfortable maintenance End of chapter five